Hello there, welcome back to Backyard Ballistics. Look at what I've got today. We got a call from the police a few weeks ago asking us to come look at some stuff that came out of an old house being renovated. What I had just found were two Stan Mark II submachine guns and a small bucket full of ammo. They must have been forgotten there for a very long time and I'll get back to their story later on, but basically one of them was in pretty bad condition. Now, I'm not a professional restorer, nor was I required to do a proper restoration job on this gun. What I was required to do, however, was establishing if the gun was functional or not, and I didn't really want to fire that rust bucket, so I decided to do what is called conservative restoration, which is essentially a deep clean from all the rust and grime, and a basic refinish, without doing anything irreversible to it. So after making sure for the umpteenth time it was unloaded, I tried rotating the magazine bay, but that was completely stuck. So I decided to oil it a bit and come back to it later. I was worried unscrewing the barrel would have been a nightmare, but it actually wasn't bad at all. And the overall conditions didn't seem too bad. You're going to be surprised by how little metal gets eroded for a given amount of rust. That's because rust has a very low density compared to steel, so a small amount of metal expands to many times its original volume when it's converted to rust. As a curiosity, this increase in volume due to corrosion is what causes concrete spalling, because the rebar expands and breaks the concrete matrix from the inside. It also looks like most of the rusting happened on the outer surface of the gun, which means that the mechanics and barrel ball should be fine. To find out if that was the case, I field stripped it and indeed it wasn't looking too bad, which gave me hope I was going to be able to save this. So I kept getting rid of some bits and pieces for a while, but I still needed to free up the magazine bay. Normally it is held in place only by this spring-loaded pin, and once this is disengaged, the whole magazine group should rotate freely. However, in my case things were pretty stuck. One of the reasons why rusty pieces get stuck to one another is because of the expansion I mentioned earlier. Rust grows between the parts and puts them under stress, causing friction. My goal here is to get some oil to infiltrate between the parts while trying to wiggle them and getting the oil and rust mixture to move. Proper penetrating oils do exist, that are made just for this purpose, but I didn't have any at the moment and also preferred using techniques that don't require special equipment so that they might be useful to some of you. I then proceeded to gently tap the magazine bay with a rubber mallet and it finally gave way. Look at how much easier it moves now. In some versions of this gun, the front side can be slid out of its dovetail and that would allow separating these two parts. In my case, however, the front side is welded in place and I didn't really want to do anything irreversible to the gun since, again, I'm not a proper restorer. These two guns are going to be put on display in a museum on World War II and I don't want to do anything irreversible that they might not approve. Even before I was able to free up the magazine bay, I had already started getting rid of some of the rust, although as I'll explain later, the approach I followed wasn't exactly the best one. You see, steel corrosion products, commonly referred to as rust, can be removed either mechanically or chemically. The chemical approach requires the least effort, but it doesn't discriminate between different iron oxides, which means that if it dissolves rust, it's also going to dissolve any remaining bluing still present on the gun. Mechanically, on the other hand, you can remove rust, which is soft and flaky, without damaging the bluing. I should have known that in my case the original finish was long gone, but I went against my own advice and started removing the rust. The most common way to do it is by using fine steel wool together with some fluid that lubricates and carries away the rust particles, normally either oil or soapy water. And of course I once again picked the least suitable option first. 
in this, I was influenced by the fact that I had already used oil to loosen up the parts for disassembly, so I started scraping while the oil was acting. Removing rust with fine steel wool and oil is the most conservative way of doing it. You can't realistically do any harm doing it, and is the method I would suggest in case some of your guns get rusty. A wire brush can be used in place of the steel wool for the most stubborn areas. Never use any commercial rust remover on a gun, they act chemically and will destroy your beautiful royal blue finishes in a heartbeat. Soapy water is faster and less messy and it leaves a practically degreased surface which means less preparation for a finishing. The main downside is that it needs to be dried thoroughly or water residues might cause new rust to form. Anyway, as I kept scraping and loosening up rust, I finally realized that there was no original finish to save so I decided to switch to the chemical method instead. However, before doing that I had to remove the paint residues. This step is not frequently encountered in restoring firearms since these are rarely painted. This isn't the case with the Sten though and a few other guns, especially from England. The Sten Mark II was painted with a black enamel applied on top of a phosphate coating, I would imagine to improve corrosion resistance. I don't know what this particular specimen went through, but the paint layer is devastated and where it failed, corrosion made it through the parkerized layer and attacked the base metal, causing diffuse surface damage. Most of the paint was already detaching, so I scraped away as much as I could before removing the rest with paint thinner. Acetone would have worked as well, but it immediately trashes nitride globs, so I went with the stinky option instead. I wasn't worried of leaving some traces of paint behind because I was still going to clean it completely with acetone before refinishing, so after most of the paint was removed, I washed and brushed the whole thing with warm soapy water off camera. What I was left with now was a mostly degreased metal surface with still some traces of rust and original phosphate coating. I needed to get rid of them and to do that I used a very simple chemical method based on a solution of citric acid with a bit of dish soap added to make it wet the surface properly. Using acids to get rid of rust and other iron oxides is the simplest of the chemical processes. Industrially, hydrochloric acid is often used as the active ingredient, but I strongly advise against using it straight on guns. The problem is that it can attack both the iron oxides, what you want to get rid of, and the base metal, which ideally you want to keep. What is worse, hydrogen forms on the surface and as it forms it can infiltrate the metal crystal lattice causing a very dangerous phenomenon called hydrogen embrittlement. Industrially corrosion inhibitors are used that prevent the acid from attacking the base metal and a heat treatment is used to prevent hydrogen embrittlement but you don't really want to go through all that effort just for a firearm. For our uses, the simplest thing that will get the job done is citric acid, since it readily dissolves iron oxides but is not strong enough to do any real damage to the metal surface. Nowadays there are even non-acidic agents that dissolve rust and oxides without damaging the substrate and they actually work very well. A famous example is Evaporust but many other brands exist. Anyway, after giving the solution time to react and a bit of brushing, we can wash it away and what we're left with is mostly a bare metal surface with very high roughness in some areas due to corrosion. Now I want to tell you something important about corrosion damage. Sometimes, like in this case, the metal oxidation takes part on a large surface and creates thousands of shallow pits. This is the least dangerous form of corrosion. It normally takes years to corrode a tenth of a millimeter. In our case, Decades of neglect didn't do much structural damage and certainly didn't compromise functionality. On the other hand, some forms of corrosion are localized in small areas or pits and proceed much faster. They are most common in stainless steels, which do rust in certain circumstances, and when they do, they do it very quickly. Anyway, at this point I was already sure I would have been able to fire these. I will let the museum people take from where I left, I don't really know what they're planning to do with it, maybe they want to bring it back to the original finish, there are even techniques to add metal on top of a damaged surface, but maybe they'll instead leave it as I'm giving it to them, so I still want to make it look as good as possible, but without doing anything that would make a proper restoration job more complicated. So what I'm doing is cleaning the parts for the last time using acetone, and then apply a cold bluing solution. Lots of commercial products exist to do this, but their working principle is the same. They are water-based solutions that, once in contact with the steel surface, react to form a chemical called copper selenide, 
a black compound that adheres to the metal surface, therefore looking similar to a conventional bluing, especially on a rough surface like the one we've got here. In traditional bluing, which can be obtained through different processes, the metal gets instead covered in magnetite, a form of iron oxide. Both techniques provide low corrosion resistance, which is why blued parts still need to be oiled, but proper bluing is more mechanically resistant, so it will wear slower than cold bluing. On the other hand, cold bluing is extremely fast, practical and forgiving. For example, it can be conveniently used for touch-ups like I'm doing on this magazine. On it, the paint had almost completely come off, but the bluing underneath was still in fair condition, so instead of removing it completely with citric acid, I just applied the cold bluing solution on top of everything. The product I'm using here is sold by Ballisto and is meant to be applied by brush, which is extremely convenient compared to immersion techniques, especially for large parts. The reaction is completed in about 3 minutes, after which you just have to rinse the part thoroughly with water, dry it with a paper towel and then apply plenty of oil. It is always important to apply plenty of oil after any bluing to contrast a phenomenon called flash rusting, where the metal quickly rusts away immediately after the process. After a few hours the excess oil can be wiped off and here's our end result. It's certainly not in mint condition, but much better than what it was when I first got it and most importantly, now I can test it properly. But before doing that, I of course need to clean the barrel. As you can see, when I got it, the ball was quite dirty, so let's give it a good scrub and see in what condition it is. I'm just using a ball brush with some oil to detach dirt and then using some paper towel to remove the sludge. I have to say that I was quite surprised by how well preserved the bore is on this one. I mean, it's not perfect, but there is no significant damage to the rifling, which means that I'm also going to do an accuracy test. Talking about that, a full in-depth video on the stand gun and this particular specimen, including many test fires, is already uploaded and will be published exactly one week after this one. At that point, you'll find it linked here. Once again, a huge thanks goes to my patrons, which as usual are all listed here. Thank you all for watching, subscribe if you'd like to see more, and I'll see you next time. Bye.